so we're here today with um, Sam Wainwright, who was the Socialist Alliance candidate in the recent federal election. Um, you've just written, recently written an article on the topic of the federal election. And, um, and, you know, I guess in particular, one of the first messages we heard from the Labor Party after the shock election result where the coalition uh, was returned to government was this idea that Labor promised too much. Labor was too ambitious in their election campaign. Uh, what's, your, what's your response to that, to that notion? Yes, well, that message has been delivered loud and clear by the heir apparent to Bill Shorten, uh, Anthony Albanese. Um, you might have seen the uh, front page of today's Australian newspaper saying, Albo ends class war. Um, now, there's two, two immediate uh, responses to that. One is, of course, Albo's class war was largely rhetorical anyway, or the Labor Party's um, class war, so-called, was largely rhetorical during the election campaign. There's a little bit of substance to it, but we'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, but secondly, um, a rhetorical question would be this. Has Anthony Albanese secured agreement from the Liberals and the bosses to end the class war as, as well? Uh, if not, does that mean he's just giving up? Um, you know, it's worth us stepping back and reflecting on the fact that the wages share of national income in this country has been in constant decline for more than three decades now. So there is this, there's a class war that never ended. And frankly, the bosses are winning it. And that's where we need to situate this, this, this discussion. Like you said, uh, almost immediately that uh, the election result came in, uh, both the commercial media commentators, but also senior Labor figures themselves started running out these lines about Labor having been too left wing, too big a target, and that kind of thing, basically signalling that the Labor Party needed to, needed to, to move to the right. Um, now... I would say that the, uh, the the real problem that the Labor Party had was that, that their left-wing policies, such as they were, was too little too late. Too much of it was a rhetoric and posture, and it was often confused and contradictory as well. So let's have a look at some of their policies. You know, one one good one, for instance, was the, was the commitment to restore our penalty rates to all those workers that had lost them. Um, in retail and hospitality. So that was genuinely a good thing. But beyond that, there was nothing really that the Labor Party was proposing that was going to uh, seriously um, attack the profits of big business, even though Bill Shorten used language about going after the big end of town. Simultaneously, Labor went after better paid working class or middle class people through the um, through the, his proposals to wind back negative gearing and franking credits. So in doing that, uh, Bill Shorten handed um, an angry mob over to, to, to Morrison, but he didn't have to really galvanise support amongst the broad mass of working people in this country. There, were, there wasn't enough real uh, left-wing policy to really inspire people. And so, as I said, apart from the, um, the turn on um, the, the policy on penalty rates, everything else was just a little bit too partial, a bit too late, a bit too clear, a bit too confused. So, for instance, extending uh, dental care to pensioners is, is, is a great thing. But it, it was going to be means tested. Uh, so the vast majority of Australians, including those who struggled to afford dental care, just couldn't just couldn't benefit. Of course, if that had been if, if Labor had said we're going to extend uh, Medicare to all dental um, um, health care, that would have transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, like, likewise, uh, a, a, an increase to New Start. So under pressure, Labor finally agreed to review new start i mean this is just ridiculous what, what needed to be reviewed i don't know so it was really people sort of saw it as having trying to have a bob each way trying to trying to uh, appeal to those um who are or have suffered um on that pitifully low new start without really actually committing to do anything there was similar confusion around the the policy on um, raising the wage of childcare workers i mean i don't think there's m many working people would begrudge a pay rise to, to childcare workers but labor themselves couldn't explain how it was that a, a, a subsidised increase to the wages of childcare workers wouldn't just be absorbed by private operators and passed on as fees. I think it would have made a lot more sense and been a lot more far-reaching, a lot more galvanising um, and, and really won a lot more votes to Labor if they said, well, we're going to, we're going to raise the minimum wage for all low-paid workers by legislation and increase our funding to the not-for-profit childcare sector. And so all the Labor didn't really have a sufficiently left or coherent program. Uh, 
And it's also worth underlining the fact that the Labor Party just had no serious or credible policy on climate change. You can't run around saying vote Labor for serious action on climate change while not declaring a position on Adani and while promising to spend $1.5 billion to facilitate a massive expansion of fracking across the top end. Like, you, you know, you either you think there's a climate emergency or you don't. Uh, so Labor's policy on that front was completely co uh, incoherent and it means that Labor is neither able to convince people that runaway global warming is a serious threat, which it is, but also it's not able to convince workers in the hydrocarbon industry, so in gas and coal, um, and obviously I say that with particular reference to the, to the votes in uh, central and northern Queensland, it's not able to convince those workers that a transition away from fossil fuels does not have to endanger their jobs, their wellbeing and their communities. Uh, those of us who have been environmentalists for a long time often talk about the need for a just transition, but really that's just become a little bit of a um, bit of a catchphrase or a slogan. It needs to have substance to it. We need to we need to sketch out a plan that's costed, that's real, that's credible, that enables workers in communities that survive from coal and gas to have real jobs in renewable energy, real real jobs in in, in environmental protect, protection and repair. Uh, that we we can't let workers in those communities think that oh somehow you know new renewable energy jobs will just sort of float out of the sky, uh, they may get those jobs or they may end up flipping burgers somewhere or something like that. No, to, to, to win this debate amongst community, communities, we need a detailed plan which shows, which demonstrates to those communities that they have nothing to lose from the transition, they have everything to gain. We need them to be in the driving seat of, of, of that um, of, of that process. And as, so as is, I said... Is, yeah. is a jobs guarantee like a, uh, like a practical demand that like, could realistically be put forward? Oh, absolutely. It, it, it's a practical demand. We, we need to be quite clear that the transition to renewable, renewables does not mean anyone should have to lose their, lose, lose their pain conditions or disrupt their communities. So, for instance, where I live in Western Australia, I think we need to be, de we need to be developing a vision that says in the community of Collie, which is based on coal mining, that should be the centre for WA's first sol um, solar thermal power plant. That should be the sort of place where we develop skills in, in manufacturing in, in, in building um, wind turbines, for instance. We, 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 it, need, it needs to be real, costed, solid jobs that people can, can see that there's a real plan and they're not going to be the victims of a transition. And la Labor can't do that because they can't take the climate change crisis seriously and they can't, and they, of course, because they are totally wedded to the fossil fuel industry, they can't talk about a serious transition. So they're really caught sort of caught on the fence on that issue um, with, without a serious policy. So they, they neither appeal to people in, in, in communities that, that depend on those on those industries, nor do they really convince people um, in the big cities that they have a serious policy on climate change either. That that's you know Labor was just really caught rudderless on um, worse than rudderless on, on this issue, uh, but the. the the positive signs that we should take is, is to re recognise that in, in other countries that are different but comparable to Australia, like the United States and Britain, we are seeing the emergence of real left-wing voices and they're embodied in part in Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party in, in Britain and in around Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders in, in the United States. Whatever the limitations or criticisms you might have of their projects and the, the struggles they faced, Nonetheless, there's a real big and growing serious audience for people that want a coherent left-wing response to the social and economic crisis who, that are looking for Australia's version of the Green New Deal. Um, and we, we saw little indicators of that potential uh, in Australia as well through the really strong showing of the Victorian socialist candidates yep. who across a whole bunch of um, Melbourne seats, working class Melbourne seats, won over 4% of the vote um, in, each, in, in all three seats that they ran. Uh, which is really credible for a um, for, for for a party that's really only just just been been around for less than a year. Um, I think it is also worth noting that the campaign by Max Chandler Mather, the Greens candidate in Griffith, who ran a very left wing campaign, perhaps the most most left wing campaign of any Greens candidate across the country, um, and won I think the second highest primary vote of any Greens candidate, um, second only behind um, Adam Bant. Very left wing, very energetic and left wing campaign. So even though the the social, political, and e economic crisis in Australia has, is not as advanced as it is um, in the United States or 
or Britain, where they 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 saw financial crisis much more sharply than we did. Um, and obviously, the example of that is the, the subprime loans crisis they had in the US. That's not to say people aren't hurting in Australia; they are most definitely, um, but it hasn't reached the sort of boiling point like it has in in, in the US or Britain. So there's more polarisation in the US and Britain. But I think um, I think you'd be a fool not to think that Australia could be not far behind. And those 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 positive election results really do point to the fact that um, there's, there's definitely an audience for co- for a coherent left wing alternative in this country that directly confronts the power of big business and the fossil fuel mafia, as I call them. There's no question that the big fossil fuel companies have Labor and Liberal uh, around their little finger. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to break open their influence over Australian politics if we're to go forward. Um, so there's positive signs for the future. I, I you know, well, it's too early exactly how that will come together in Australia. It's hard to see a Jeremy Corbyn in Australia um, emerging in the way that it happened in Britain, both because there's nobody um, in the Australian Labor Party who's really got the, as the politics of Jeremy Corbyn, and also the Australian Labor Party doesn't have the mechanism that would allow the rank and file of the Labor Party to actually elect a leader over the, over the head of their more conservative parliamentary colleagues. So who knows how that's going to emerge in Australia. I dare say it'll, it'll need to draw on good good people who are still in the Labor Party, left-wing Greens, socialists, trade unionists, community activists, environmentalists. Um, but we've seen some positive signs that such a thing can or will emerge in Australia, and I think the tasks for anybody who wants to see that happen here um, coming out of this election is just basically to hit the ground running. Um, and it, the conditions that, that are going to help um, mature that um, is precisely grassroots struggle in our communities, on the streets, in our workplaces, in our places of education against the very policies of the Morrison government. There's no point waiting um, three years for the next election. The, the, the work we need to do to build a political alternative needs to happen on the ground, in the streets, right here and now. Hmm. Okay, well, isn't it funny? I mean, you basically addressed pretty much all the things I was going to ask you about, even though I didn't ask you half those questions. I mean, I think obviously the 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 challenge of building the alternative is actually is actually the real challenge. And I guess I guess one way to one way to um, I guess one thing would be worth addressing directly, even though maybe you've say you've given an, an implied answer, but there is a certain layer of people basically saying things like, you know. Um, I guess drawing negative conclusions about the electorate. People voted for cruelty or people are stupid. Uh, I mean, like one version of that is the kind of I'm going to New Zealand, Australia's fucked. There's also the fuck Queensland um, kind of line of argument as well. There's also the people saying, you know, um, yeah, no, 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 what would you say to those, to those, I guess what would you say directly to people who basically put that argument, oh, well, the electorate is fucked. People voted for cruelty or for you know, people didn't don't care about climate change. They don't care about Adana. They just voted for their own hip pocket. Whatever people are too aspirational. How whatever the whatever the variations on that. What would you say to people who say the fault is with the electorate? Look, I think there's this. I'd give two responses to that. The first is we need to temper this idea that somehow there was some great big endorsement of the Liberals and Scott Morrison. You know, if you look at the primary vote, there was um, the, the there was a, a, a small swing against both Labor. Um, and the other thing you could say is that um, on primary votes alone, I believe Labor and uh, on last count, both Labor and the Greens combined vote is ahead of the of the uh, Liberal and National Party vote. So really, there was there was no great change. Um, of course, in Australian politics, um, it's not enough to get the majority of votes across the whole of the country. It's it's where you get them. So that's the that's the first thing we shouldn't we shouldn't overstate this as somehow Australia's big Trump movement massive shift to the right. I mean, that's a bit of a misinterpretation in the United States as well. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, if you're committed to a project of social change, as I am, that and, and you, you're, you're confident in the belief that the majority of ordinary working people can be won over to a vision for a socially just, environmentally sustainable future where everyone can live in dignity and that we need to confront and break the power of big business to do that, then... You have to be positive about ordinary working people, including those that voted conservative. Um, you can't write people off and blame them. That's not going to achieve anything. Um, and also, you know, of course, people, um, when they vote, they, they're going to vote for what they think is their self-interest. Um, now, plenty of times working people vote for politicians who don't really serve their interest, but think they do. But let's be realistic. 
since when it, since when is anyone going to vote for, for for going to vote against their material self interest in an election? That you know you're not going to build a majority on that on, on that basis. So you know our struggle is to convince people that, and and this is you know particularly pertinent if we're talking about those coal mining communities in Queensland, is that the LNP does not represent their long term material interests. That we have a vision for the future that is more secure, more just, more inclusive, more democratic than anything the LNP has got on offer. Um, you know, if coal mining communities feel threatened for their jobs right now um, and no one is offering an alternative beyond a vague wish list or, or a vague reference to, to, to just transition without, without, any, without any specifics, then of course people are going to keep voting for politicians that they think are going to protect the coal industry. Um, it's, it's, it's utterly naive to think it would be otherwise. I mean, that just demonstrates the, the you know, the complexity and the seriousness of the challenge we face. But we, we, we always had that, we always had that challenge. Running around saying, oh, people in central Queensland, you know, don't care about their children um, is, is just patently absurd and insulting. It's not going to help us win those people over. Um, and of course, you know, they, of course, they care about children as anyone else does in the inner city of Melbourne or Sydney. So probably for those of us who've been very invested in the environment movement and the campaign uh, around global warming and against Adani, we're sincere when we say that there needs to be a just transition, but we haven't done the hard work to, to, to map out what that might be like. Um, and as I've already said, it's, you know, clearly the Labor Party has not had to do it. And um, yes, in, in theory, the union movement should be doing it, um, but leaving it to the union movement is not going to be enough. I mean, the, the, the union movement hasn't done it either because the union movement, by and large, is so tied to the Labor Party that it's not able to grasp, properly grasp this question of what a, a transition away from fossil fuels would really look like either, a transition that still guarantees people the jobs and conditions, you know, the, the wages and conditions uh, the com and the community connections they currently enjoy. You know, of course, there are people in the union movement who are thinking about it. Um, and but I think those of us who are campaigning against Adani and against fossil fuels more, more generally need to connect with them and start to bring the pressure um, and vision um, from outside, um, and 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 attempt to bring um, the union movement and large layers of workers with us in that process. Yeah, I guess one argument I've heard people make is that, you know. There was nothing the Labor Party could have done in the context of the Clive Palmer scare campaign. And really, you know, the Labor Party, you know, did offer more than usual. Um, you know, and I, and I think there's, you know, I think there's some justice in that. I think like, you know, if you compare what the Labor Party put an offer in this election to some of the, um, some of the elections the Labor contested against Howard, um, I, think that's, I think that's a fair argument. Um, but so if say, but you know, if Labor put forward more than usual, and they just, you know, they were just faced with this, you know, multi-million-dollar Clive Palmer scare campaign, what you know, what else could they have done? What would you say to that? Look, I think I think you're I think you're correct that Labor did more than um, more than it usually does. Um, but I think it's incorrect to say that it that it couldn't have still won the election. Um, and in actual fact, it needed to do more to win the election. So yes, Clive Palmer ran that scare campaign, um, and I think I think with that, that that Clive Palmer scare campaign, it certainly illustrates that um, there are a layer of people in Australia, you know, because you know we often wonder, you know, what what on earth would make you vote, you know, vote for Clive Palmer or listen to Clive Palmer? Yeah. He's, yeah, he's such a self -interest, interested charlatan. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who, and I won't pretend to sort of put a figure on just what percentage of the population, but yeah, I think there's a significant layer of the population who are disenchanted with politics as usual, who are pissed off with the Labor Party and Liberal Part Party, uh, rightly so, but they're not the sort of people who particularly follow politics. They're not interested in politics. And so come election day, they're there in the, in the voting booth, you know, they're feeling a bit pissed off. How are they going to express that? Oh, yeah, they, they saw Clive Palmer's ad, you know, that... that Briefly, sort of flash through their, um, like Palmer, you know. Um, so that's you know we we have to work against that. Also, I don't. I think um, yes, Clive Palmer ran an effective scare campaign, and 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 he's admitted that he his objective was to consciously polarise people against Labor. 
But the whole the whole thing is that once you start escalating things, you've got to play to win. You've got to go hard and you've got to play to win. And so the Labor Party uh, was unable to recognise the fact that it needed it needed to be bolder still to really mob- mobilise uh, people in its support. So, you know, if 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 you're a working, uh, uh, you know, a worker who's on New Start or experienced New Start and is pissed off with politics, aren't particularly progressive, are thinking about voting One Nation or Black Farmer, would Bill Shorten's promise to review New Start be enough to galvanise you and think, yeah, I'll go back to Labor? No. Would Bill Short, if, if you're in a low-paid job, would Bill Shorten's promise to increase the wages of childcare workers, but not your wages, even though because you work in disability support or do a nursing home, would Bill Shorten's promise have been necessary enough to galvanise you? No. If you are if you are a working per, you know a working person or low income um, that can't afford um, to get a rotten tooth fixed, the fact that Bill Shorten has said, "Oh well, we're going to extend." dental care to about 80,000 pensioners, but not the vast majority of working people, would that have inspired you to, 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 come, to come to Labor? No. So my, my point is this, that yes, Labor, both rhetorically and in a few instances, genuinely pitched themselves more to the left than they have in a long time. There still just wasn't enough substance to really excite inspire and mobilise hundreds of thousands, if not millions of working people, that this was something real, crisp, new and different. And I think Labor really needed to do that because Bill Shorten is probably the least inspiring salesperson they have, you know. If Bill Shorten was going to convince people, really convince hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that he was genuine, he was different, all the rest of it, it was going to need a real um, sharp policy break like that. Um, Whereas, you know... Uh, built with, with with the sort of offerings that Labor did put forward, um, so, you know, I mean, Bill Shorten just wasn't going to be able to do it. You know, in, in, in general, politics is more important than personality, but certainly, you know, personality was always a drag for Bill Shorten, and that, that's also something that, um, that Clive Palmer really sort of aimed at. And, um, and as I said, if Bill Shorten was really going to throw that off, that, that perception that he was just a sort of a boring wooden party machine man, didn't really stand for anything, you know, it was just sort of chopping and changing around politics in an opportunist kind of way. If he was, if he, if he was really going to throw off that image and inspire people who generally don't pay attention to politics, then it was, going to, it was definitely going to have to be much bolder, much more crisp, much more inspiring than it was. So I think that conclusion that, that there was nothing the Labor Party could have done against the, 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 the Clive Palmer scare campaign is completely false. I mean, think about the consequences. If you, if you really think that's true, then, then we can never change Australian politics uh, for, for the better. Um, so, no, I, I, just, I, I think that's wrong. And if, if, you, if, you, look, if you look at the, the vitriol and the scorn that I on Jeremy Corbyn for proposing a much more left-wing program than, than what Australian Labor is proposing... Um, you can see that despite that media war against against Shorten and uh, sorry against um, Corbyn and his vision, uh, people are rallied to it. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that, that that's a good uh, that's a good way to finish. Um, so thanks for joining us today on Green Left TV. 